Hello and welcome to the Director's Cut. Today, I'm delighted to be in conversation with Cecilia Alimani, the Director and Curator of the Highline, a very unusual space. Just to set the stage, the Highline is an elevated freight rail line transformed into a public park on Manhattan's west side. It was to be demolished because it was no longer in use, but the community residents organized themselves into the Friends of the Highline and fought to save it. And now they are all responsible for maintaining and running it after it opened in 2009. Here's the interesting part. The walkway is just eight feet wide and about a mile and a half long. But it is more than just a space where you enjoy beautiful vegetation that grows naturally. It is also one of the most extraordinary art spaces, the vision for which, which has been led by Cecilia over the last 10 years. I love the way she describes the space that she works with, a museum without a ceiling. In addition to her commitments at the Highline, Cecilia served as the artistic director of the first edition of Art Basel Cities in Buenos Aires in 2018. And the previous year, she was curator of the Italian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. She is now the artistic director of the 59th Biennale in Venice that has been postponed by a year to 2022 because of the pandemic. As you can see, she is a woman with a lot on her plate. So let's just dive into the conversation. And a quick reminder before that to send in your questions to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And in the last 10 minutes, we'll take some questions. Cecilia, thank you for being with us today. I thought we Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited to be with you all. As we are. I thought we'd start with the Biennale because that is probably where your attention is going to be focused for the next few months. And you've had so many questions about the challenges of choosing artists and works for the exhibition without being able to travel to see them. But before we come to that, um, could we explore the idea of whether the pandemic has become a sort of watershed moment for us in the art world as well. Has it, um, or will it change in some very fundamental way, the whole process of the way art is conceived, presented and shared in the future? Or if I could be more specific, has it altered the way you have conceived the Biennale? Does it impact it in any material sense or will we all just wander into those marvelous spaces as if it's business as usual, and it's just the 59th Biennale that we are seeing a year later than it was meant to be. Well, you know, um, it's a complex question, question because it's a complex situation. So I think a few, um, a few remarks on um, what it meant to organize such a large, large exhibition in this past um, 14 months, of course, um, one of the biggest challenges for me was uh, not to be able to travel. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's usually the, the, the best part of uh, organizing such a global exhibition is that you get to know uh, so many different uh, art scenes and cultures, which of course I'm I might be familiar with, but being there, as we all know, is so important. And that's, uh, in a way, it's the paradox of my situation for which uh, uh, on one side, I had more time because the show was postponed. Uh, but on the other side, I basically had to do my entire research and uh, preparation on my computer, um, which uh, has been mentally extremely exhausting. But at the same time, I want to say that having done hundreds, literally hundreds of Zoom studio visits. Uh, on one side, I actually were able, was able to meet more artists because I saved the time of travels and, and moving from place to place. So I actually, probably I have met more artists than I would have if I were traveling to these places. And that something that was surprising to me is that even through the mediation of the screen and through Zoom, I was able to have very honest uh, and very kind of intimate conversations with the artists. Maybe sometimes, you know, as you, uh, as a curator, when you go for a studio visit, sometimes there is this sort of, um, not tension, but a little bit of embarrassment of this person that is, you know, it's a stranger that comes to your studio and you sort Invading of- your space. 
yeah, and you have to kind of perform. Uh, in a way, we at Zoom, you kind of get rid of that. And I thought I was able to actually capture more. I mean, of course, you, you know, you don't get to see the, the work in person, but uh, I think the intimate conversations that I had with the artists were really extraordinarily important in kind of converging in the theme of the exhibition and in the preoccupations that the exhibition wants to capture. And I do think those conversations likely would not have happened normally in a studio bit. So that's the good part. Um, and then, you know, I think it's, um, I think the Biennale will happen for many people will be very much business as usual. Um, you know, I was just in Venice a few weeks ago for the Architecture Biennale, which just opened um, at the end of May. And it felt, I, I hate to say normal, but it felt uh, uh, quite uh, quiet and accessible. And, uh, you know, there are very small things that probably a visitor wouldn't even notice, you know, um, you know, everything becomes, um, like access wise becomes more digital of course you have digital tickets but it's nothing you know venice still had paper tickets so i think there are small things that are changing that are just kind of improving the system but the experience of the exhibition of the architecture biennale was very much uh, uh, was fairly similar to the past okay so i'm glad to hear that you know because we always think of the serendipity of little conversations that you have, that you have in person and things that you stumble on, but it's great to hear that you were able to overcome that and manage to go through um, and, 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 and get the artists that you want or have the conversations that you wanted. I actually wanted to talk now, now a little about the, the title of the Biennale itself and the theme for the Biennale, The Milk of Dreams. So that's the title and the theme. And the name is borrowed from a book by Leonardo Carrington a surrealist artist whose stories describe, and I quote, a magical world where life is constantly re-envisioned through the prism of the imagination. But her work is both fanciful and terrifying at the same time. And I would like to give, ask you to give us a sense of the several ideas that this theme unpacks, because from all that I've read, the starting point seems to be a more sustainable relationship between man and, and the world he lives in. Yeah, so the, as you say, the title I chose for Venice is The Milk of Dreams or Il Latte dei Sogni in Italian. And it is taken by this little book that the surrealist artist Leonora Carrington uh, put together uh, when she lived in Mexico City because she's a British artist, but um, from the mid forties, she fled mm -hmm. Europe for the war and, and basically relocated to Mexico where she spent her entire life until she died 10, 11 years ago. Hmm. Um, so um, the book is, I find it extraordinary because it talks about hybrid creatures and uh, yeah. monsters and um, <laughs> you know, these sort of uh, uh, like fanciful uh, creatures that merged human and animal and machine and something that I always find fascinating about her is that when she was asked uh, uh, when she was born she would reply I wasn't born I was made by the encounter of my mother with a um, with a machine and um, so I kind of I think this sort of hybridity and transformation and metamorphosis is very much at the core of her first of, of her artistic practice and you see it very well in her paintings and sculptures mm -hmm. but also in the amazing books that she's written and uh, not just the milk of dreams but she has uh, put together incredible short stories and novels so she's an amazing amazing writer so I got to her but also because through her books and I was really interested in in reading uh, I'm always fascinated by when artists are also uh, writers so um, but so basically what the uh, exhibition tries to, uh, to do is uh, to create like a journey uh, mm -hmm. through the metamorphosis of the body and uh, definitions of humanities. And this is where both Leonora's kind of world and, 
and the many questions that the artist uh, sort of uh, brought up in these many conversations are converging. So many of the questions that the artist brought up in this kind of time of crisis and reflection and, mm. and pause were how do we define life? How do we define humanity? And how can we um, imagine a world or live in a world where um, uh, the man uh, is no longer at the center of the universe and measure of all things as the enlightenment taught us, but uh, is actually um, creating a more sustainable relationship with other species, with animals, with plants, even with the non-human and with the planet. And so imagining a kind of um, horizontal uh, kinship with other beings. And so I think this is something that has been in people's mind. Of course, you know, it, it's not necess necessarily uh, just uh, um, something that is happening now. This is part of what, you know, in philosophy, it's called the post-human and post-humanist thought. But I think these questions <laughs> have become incredibly relevant right now um, mm -hmm. and in a, a very accelerated way. Uh, so what that means in the exhibition uh, mm -hmm. is that there are like three sort of uh, themes or threads or so. Mm -hmm. One is the representation of bodies and uh, their metamorphosis. Um, another one is the relationship between humans and technologies. Uh, and finally, the connection between bodies and the earth. So while the body is always at the center, I'm interested in exploring what is the relationship with ourself, uh, with technology on one side. And when I say technology, I mean in a very broad sense, uh, mm -hmm. and then with, the, with, the, with our surroundings. So a lot of this will actually be influenced by what we as, as a human race have gone through because of the crisis that we experienced during the last year? I think so, but not in an um, illustrative way. Mm -hmm. So I'm not interested necessarily in, uh, you know, sometimes it might sound a little bit like, uh, you know, the climate change, <laughs> like <laughs> the climate. It's not like um, a, it's not an exhibition that portrays the world as it is. Um, I'm more interested in the hopeful depiction of the world as it may be uh, or will be in the future. So I'm less interested in, you know, bringing artworks that depict the, you know, the, the tragedy of the climate disaster and so forth. But I'm more interested in artists who use that uh, sort of negative energy or this uh, this time of crisis to produce, to look at the future and propose either alternative or move forward, not just backwards. Yeah, I really like the way you link the various arts. You know, you, you start, you take literature, then you link it in some way to visual arts. And it's, it's really lovely to see that interconnection because I think the, mm -hmm. each of the arts enriches the other. And, and it's so nice when we are able to link them all. And so many artists have done that before. I think maybe it's time now to come to the high line which seems sure. to have an extraordinary number of things going on at the same time, where you can enjoy nature or art, or go jogging, or just people watch. So the Hainan has, what it's done is really expanded the role of contemporary art in public spaces. We'd really like to hear how you go, go about that, because in India, for example, contemporary art has been limited to certain kinds of people or certain spaces. It's, it's not something that, you know, the general public usually goes to. So how have you managed to take art in the, into the heart of the community? Yeah, so maybe we can pull the first image um, as I speak. Uh, so as you said, the Highland is, uh, uh, is, um, is the public park. It's, built, it's of course, it's, uh, it's not necessarily the park that you imagine when you say park in New York City, usually you think of Central Park, which is of course the more traditional park. Um, what the Highland is, is built on this bridge that you see in this picture, which was um, an old train, like railway built in the 1930s uh, for freight trains. Uh, but then in the 80s, it was completely abandoned because it was too expensive to maintain. Uh, and then for two decades, it was completely abandoned. Uh, and then at the end of the 1990s, the city was looking at demolishing it because what happened is that 
the people that owned the land under the High Line could not develop um, because you had a kind of bridge on top of you. Uh, but then in 1999, a group of uh, community members, actually it was just two guys, um, decided to come together and found an organization called Friends of the High Line with the goal of saving the Highland from demolition and turn it into a public park. And so what happened, it took 10 years, which maybe we can do another discussion another time, but it's, uh, it was uh, an incredible effort from the community and from many supporters and the city uh, to, instead of tearing it down, reuse the actual structure, which is made of steel and just transform it into a public amenity. Back in the 90s, nobody had an idea that this would become like I think number three destination in New York after the Statue of Liberty and the Empire State Building. Uh, but um, now the Highland has been open since 2009, so mm -hmm. over 10 years. And since the beginning, the founders wanted to have art at the, uh, as one of the layers. And I think to me, as also as a visitor, one of the most uh, striking aspects of the Highland is that it really is unique in the sense that it brings to the public so many different experiences. So, um, you know, you have these beautiful, gorgeous gardens that have been designed by this Dutch horticulturalist called Piet Udoff, who is amazing and really brought a completely new kind of experience to uh, New York City. And then you have, um, you know, people come also to see the Highland as a sort of industrial reuse project, because now it's so yeah. popular, of course, to turn, you know, old buildings and infrastructures into amenities. Uh, and then uh, people come also to see the city from a completely different perspective. You're like uh, 10 meters high in the sky, uh, right. and it's a, it's a height that is nowhere to be found in New York. Usually you see the city either from the street or from the skyscraper. Mm -hmm. And then there is art. So uh, I think the conjunction of these four different um, experiences is what make the Highlands so special. But going back to art, uh, since the beginning, I've been there 10 years ago, from like starting 10 years ago, we uh, mm -hmm. wanted to expand also the uh, definition of public art or what you might expect. Because very often, also in New York City, you know, when you think of public art, you think of mm -hmm. downtown Manhattan, you see, you think of the colder, the Mark the Suver, like heavy uh, steel works, uh, which is, of course, you know, we also love, but in a way for us, there was also the, the understanding that you cannot present artworks like that usually on the Highland, but just because there is no space. So we turned a challenge into something uh, quite inspirational to expand the program and to think of it a bit outside the box. So for instance, this slide that you see is my first, one of my first projects from 2012, and it's an amazing piece by uh, Elan Atsui, an artist uh, uh, based in Nigeria now. And what he does, he, you might know him because he weaves together these incredible pieces of basically garbage that could be the bottle cups, so it could be, in this case, there were pieces of uh, barrels. He weaves them together in this beautiful tapestry that then had mirrors inside. So as you walk through, uh, at some point, you know, you would see uh, the sky reflected into it. And so it became this uh, very powerful um, artwork, which at the same time was quite invisible and many people maybe didn't even notice it. But what was special for us was also to be able to expand beyond the Highlands. So that building that you're looking at where the artwork is installed mm -hmm. is not, first of all, it's gone now, and, but it's <laughs> weird for me to look at it, but it's, uh, it, it doesn't belong to the Highlands. So we approached the owner and asked if we could use it because one of the uh, so goals of the Highline art project is also to use the city as a giant canvas and as a pedestal. So not necessarily to focus on the Highland. I mean, of course, we do plenty of things on the Highland, but why don't we use all these many blank facades that are everywhere along the park? So that was um, one of the most successful projects that we did. And then if you please go to the next slide. Um, it really sounds completely... like a lot of fun. Cecilia, before you move forward, I remember yeah. seeing a, a few pictures of you installing this and then there was a storm and it was all over the place. Tell us about that. That sounded just quite incredible because here's this museum without a ceiling and with moving walls. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, this was uh, 
2012. And, you know, I, I always make fun of the fact that when I started doing this job, I didn't have a background in public art. And mm -hmm. I remember that with the production person that I work with, he kept saying, you know, everything that we do needs to be uh, wind resistant and windproof for mm -hmm. 70 miles per hour, which is hurricane wind. And I was like, what? what are you talking about? I mean, there's never <laughs> wind in your city. And in September that year, as we were installing this piece, Sandy hit. You remember the big hurricane that came to New York and flooded the entire city. Manhattan was with no power for seven days. Um, and, it, you know, we had this camera uh, installed somewhere, like a time-lapse camera that captured, and the piece was fine because it was indeed, you know, engineered to, to support uh, wind, but it was, uh, it was kind of uh, shocking. And the weather has gotten worse and worse, you know, like now, because there are so many also new buildings next to the Highland, the winds that come in are completely intense. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we have to adapt to that as well. But everything that we do is kind of vetted by an engineer and architect. So it's, uh, it's fine. And, you know, something important is that art on the Highland stays on view maximum for one year. So um, we like to rotate them because of many reasons, but also they're not necessarily artworks that are supposed to be there forever. Okay, so you have to come to Bangalore and teach us how to install art in public places because we're waiting, we're looking to transform this city as well on something like the Highland, <laughs> the lines of the Highland. But you know, it's, okay. it's yeah, but the Highland is now recognized as a space that commissions exceptional pro projects and encourages dialogues with the surrounding spaces. So is, have you envisioned this as an experimental space that foregrounds the work of emerging artists rather than established names? And maybe you could show us some more works that you feel have made a difference? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. let's go to the next slide. Um, I, I like to show the next slide because uh, it's like the opposite. <laughs> so this is um, a picture of a large installation by Daniel Buren, the French artist that you all know because of his stripe paintings yeah. uh, or installations. And in a way, he decided to cover um, about 400 meters of a very special section of the Highland that curves with this sort of canopy of flags. So it's almost like you were walking into a painting uh, and it, had, it was accompanied by music. It was a festive celebration of color uh, and space. Uh, and so again, sometimes it's important to think that public art doesn't necessarily have to be a bronze sculpture, which we love, by the way, and I'll show you more, but it can also be the, experience, the joyful experience of, 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 of the moment that can be also driven by large ephemeral uh, sculptures. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, I also show you something that is also quite important for the Highland, which is uh, the passage of time and, and the season. Um, so here you see, four slides of an artwork by Rashid Johnson, who is an American artist. Um, and so starting mm -hmm. from the top left, the side, actually, sorry, that this is starting from the top right. Uh, that's when the piece was installed in April. And the piece is basically a minimalist cube with this yellow bus inside. And then if you go to the bottom left, you see that's what happens in the summer. So the vegetation starts growing and gets integrated in the piece. And that was very important for the artists who wanted that to be one of the ingredients of her sculpture. Then at the bottom right, you see the beautiful fall colors uh, of the piece that becomes almost one thing, one whole thing with the rest of the landscape. And then at the top left, uh, the piece under the snow, because of course it snows a lot in New York and we have to keep that in mind as well. Um, but as a rule, we, you know, we invite artists to really establish a dialogue also with nature and the gardens meaning that we are never going to cut a tree or like, uh, you know, bushes to accommodate a piece. Of course, we have to fix them. But other than that, you know, artists have to embrace the fact that sometimes uh, the artwork might be uh, covered by snow, by plants, by birds. And, and that's the beauty of it, because it really allows, especially the local community, to come back and see the same piece over and over again in completely different circumstances. It's lovely and to see the big bush, this bush in the front on the on the on the right corner down. Mm -hmm. it, it sort of picks up the color of the artwork, the yellow of the artwork. 
yeah so yeah there is <laughs> these incredible rhymes that happen um and you know i i wish i could tell you ah yes it was curated by you know it was all <laughs> thought about but no it wasn't um but that's i think the i think one of the also the beauties of public art and that's why i like that kind of feel more than working in a museum is that in a way you know you can work as hard as you can before to make these works to think about everything that could possibly happen but once they're out there they're out there and you can't do anything about them so i think the most beautiful and rewarding part of this job is really um let the work go and see how people embrace how people or nature or the elements embrace it because it basically starts uh, living a life outside your the curator's hand when it's installed and so I always love to see like how people actually use the work sometimes you know you can you, you try you brainstorm so much and then the most banal thing happens and you're like ah I never thought about it so but that's that's actually the beauty of it yeah sometimes the art on just nature takes over right <laughs> yeah exactly are there any more pictures that you have yeah yeah please go to the next one um which i think is a funny one um yeah. you know the, the highland is a public park so it's part of the city of new york city um and this is an art tour by an artist called josh klein who uh, wanted to sort of make fun of what you expect to see in a park so um, you know, sometimes you have vending machines, you want like a bottle of water or whatever. And so what he did, he created this vending machine that looks totally like a sort of fridge that you would see, you know, in, in a store in, New York, in, a, in a bodega in New York City. And, you know, everybody in New York, I'm sure, so they are obsessed with these kind of power drinks and smoothies and like all healthy stuff. And so he created this fridge with these 12, I believe, or 15 different kinds of uh, uh, smoothies, uh, but it actually wasn't a vending machine. So you would approach and realize that actually there was no way of opening the door or putting the money in. And as you got closer, you saw that each bottle uh, had, you know, they, they list the ingredients on the face of the bottle. And instead of having very healthy things like apple and kale and carrot, he actually was listing these very weird things that were inside the bottles which were portraits of people from different neighbors uh, in New York City. So there was one about Williamsburg, which is a sort of hipster, um, hipster neighborhood in Brooklyn. And so it would contain cake chips, but also shredded credit card, TVs, CDs, and other weird, like American apparel, <laughs> undies, like, like all kind of a parody of what you expect to see um, when you visit those places. No, I saw the famous photograph of this because there were old people standing in a queue outside this waiting to sort of use the vending machine thinking they could get a bottle yeah, out. We even got a fine from the city of New York because we actually were not allowed to have a vending machine. Uh, and so they thought it was actually a vending machine, which was really funny. Um, maybe we go to the next one. Uh, and this is, a, again, it's an early project. Uh, again, it's shocking for me to look at this picture because none of these buildings is still there, like parking lots have been built out. But this was a billboard that was already there uh, and was used for, you know, commercial stuff. But then we convinced the owner to uh, to use it to commission projects. And so the, the piece that you see is by Faith Ringle, who is a wonderful artist uh, based here in New York. And she's famous for making these gorgeous uh, quilts. And so we reproduced one of the images of a quilt of hers in this large vinyl. This is like 75 feet across, so it's giant. Uh, and it's important for us because it's a project that, of course, is very visible from the Highland, but also from the avenue below. So as you drive up 10th Avenue, you can see this. And our goal was to sort of give hints to the public and to the people walking or driving that uh, the Highland is also an art destination and you can come and appreciate also these incredible artworks that change on a regular base. Um, maybe we go to the next one. Uh, and this is also a very early project, but something that we've continued doing. This is a Trisha Brown performance uh, that two people with red clothes on the on the roof. Uh, and this is to say that besides, of course, uh, traditional sculptures, installations, sound pieces, billboard and murals. We've also done lots of performances. And that to me 
is on one side is the hardest part because uh, when you work with people is of course it's more complicated logistically but it mm. is in a way the part that is the most active that really involves the best part of the highland which is its people the people that come to see uh, and so we've done a ton of performances on the highland of the highland but really to 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 capture this energy that comes also for the viewers uh, and that uh, can really see a performance in a completely different setting than you know the black box or the theater or the white cube. So this was a series of dancers on the rooftop of the meatpacking district, which is the south side of the of the High Line. Mm -hmm. uh, and then next, I think, is the last one. <coughs> and then just to conclude with this work, which uh, in a way looked like the most traditional that I've shown you so far. It's a work by Simon Lee. Um, uh, but what's, uh, what's important for us here is that this is a section of the High Line that goes over 10th Avenue and is the newest section that opened just a few years ago. Uh, and uh, if you go to the next slide, it's the only section on the High Line that is not just a very narrow path, uh, but it's a lar large for our uh, standard. So it's actually it's still very small, but uh, it's a large gathering space. It's a basically a piazza. And so when we were refurbishing it, instead of bringing the sort of usual architectural and design landscape of the Highland, we decided to give art a central spot. So in this kind of rectangular space, we decided that in the middle of it, we would put a plinth, a base, a pedestal, and then we would commission and produce monumental works of mm -hmm. art that uh, could change over 18 months, uh, but could really spark conversation because in a way, this is the only place on the Highland where it's basically a cul-de-sac, it just ends there. There is not nowhere else to go. So in a way, the behavior, the use of the space is rather different. So instead of just walking, because that's what you usually do on the Highland, here you can sit, look at the art, be inspired and have conversation. And so that's for us, the most important part of this section is really art as a, as a way of triggering conversations about some of today's uh, most relevant topics. Absolutely, really. Even we're thinking of map as, you know, a place that's it's, it's for ideas and conversations and you get people to come in. So it's like a cultural hub where you, you, know, sure. you have this excitement. Yeah. And, and you've also done, introduced a lot of video works as well, right? In this space. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't put any picture, but we have a um, video program which is called Highland mm -hmm. Channel, uh, which my mm -hmm. colleague uh, Melanie Kress oversees. And uh, it, this goes along with the idea of sort of expanding the, the definitions of public art. So uh, it's very simple, you know, we have a projector and it's in one of the covered passages because of course, uh, well now with LED screen, you could actually do it also during the day, but uh, a while ago when we started, it's just a traditional projector um, under one of these tunnels and we have a screen so it's very integrated in the in the let's say in the landscape of the highland but every every night from sunset to the closing of the park we showcase mm -hmm. films and videos by contemporary artists we curate about six programs per year so the same kind of exhibition happens for a couple of months but it's a way of bringing moving images to the park and also there is something unexpected, especially for the general viewer to encounter a film or like an art video in a park. Uh, but it's also a way of bringing sound and bringing music to especially a specific location of the Hana that is not necessarily uh, as gorgeous or well taken as other. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a way also of beautifying that space. Yeah. I want our audiences also to, to understand the, the scope of the work that you've really done, Cecilia. And so it would be great for you to tell us about the exhibition that you created for Art Basel Cities in Buenos Aires. Hopscotch, as it was called, you know, have helped transform the city and allowed people to experience art in a unique way through the connections that were made between uh, visual arts, urban spaces, and the history of the city. So the name comes from a novel actually by the Argentinian writer Julio Cortazar. And, and it's really interesting to hear, I, I want you to hear what Chichita had to say about it. As for the book and the game, my art program Hopscotches Through the City shaping possible journeys and different paths through urban space, creating unexpected connections between sites and artworks. 
So, Chichila, is this really the way forward to make sure that art enters the public realm rather than remaining within the four walls of a museum? Just give us a sense of what you did and how it worked. Yeah, so the project in Buenos Aires was a partnership between the city of Buenos Aires on one side mm -hmm. that commissioned this project mm -hmm. and our Basel, the art fair um, in Switzerland that basically executed it. And so our Basel invited me to be the curator of the first edition. Uh, and the goal of the project was to um, highlight the incredible art scene that is already in Buenos Aires. And it's really truly wonderful uh, by also uh, putting Buenos Aires a little bit more on the art, global art map, uh, because of course, Buenos Aires is an incredible place with incredible museums and artists. But it is a little bit off the, the map just because of its geographic location, because it's very, very south in South America. Doesn't have a big biennial like Sao Paulo, for instance, doesn't have an art fair. So it can, the goal was for it to become a destination exactly like uh, Miami became a destination in the early 2000s when Art Basel happened there but without the art fair. So there was nothing commercial about this project. There was no art fair, no market, but the uh -huh. goal was to recreating what surrounds these big art fairs in terms of cultural vibrancy and effervescence. Um, yeah. And so uh, what we did, I was invited to do a large scale public art projects in the city. Mm -hmm. um, and we use incredible, incredible, amazing venues that uh, some were small local museums, uh, other uh, were abandoned industrial sites, but the idea was to create a journey through the city of Buenos Aires in, an, in neighborhoods, especially that are not necessarily usually the destination for art. Uh, and so the idea of taking the Julio Cortazar book called Hopscotch uh, or Rayuela in, uh, in um, Spanish was because the book, of course, that legendary book by a very important Argentinian artist was the uh, is structured in a way that you can read it from the first chapter to the la last chapter. Also, you can follow a special structure, like a kind of hidden structure, jumping from one chapter to the other without following a linear narrative. And I like this sort of uh, metaphor of discovering the city and making your own journey through the city. So there were about 18 projects, um, I would say at least three quarters of them by local Argentinian artists and then some international artists. But it was a way to invite, especially the local community, to, to go to places they would never, ever go, especially to see art. And from mm -hmm. that perspective, not only looking at this art piece, but also looking back at their, their own city from the perspective of the art. And so, for instance, one of the interesting part is that Buenos Aires is on, on you know, it's on the river, but apparently the way it was built is inwards. So there is like the waterfront is not really um, developed at all. And so we did a lot of projects on the waterfront because it, it's actually wonderful. And so lots of people <coughs> just told me that they've never been there in 20 years. And so this was also a way of, you know, rediscovering the city. And also, you know, Buenos Aires has really important museums and galleries. But the public art scene is not particularly relevant. It's still quite traditional. You know, it's more like monuments of the colonizers or whatever, bronze monuments of men uh, everywhere in the city. So it was also nice to, to be able to, uh, to work with local artists, but in a very different medium. That could be murals, or it could be uh, performance um, pieces, or, you know, completely different mediums. Yeah, it's very interesting because here was a an exhibition that was looked in at a city particularly, whereas the, the Venice Biennale really isn't about location, right? It's a, it's a huge difference in what you're doing. It's much more international. Yeah, that's a very good point. You know, sometimes uh, you go to biennials because you assume you're going to learn a lot about um, the local scene or like, you know, if, if I go to Sao Paulo, I imagine that I will encounter lots of Brazilian artists. I don't think anyone has that assumption when they go to Venice of seeing Italian art, which of course it's dear to me and it will be uh, definitely a highlight of my show, but um, it is definitely a global exhibition. I think it mm -hmm. has to do also with the structure of the show itself, which uh, it's not just the international show, but also 
uh, is based on the national pavilions. There are about nine national pavilions. So um, yeah, I think it's 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 a, it's just a different experience. I mean, in a way, you know, Venice is also this sort of magical but also invisible imaginary city. You know, it's uh, uh, it's it's a museum itself on its own, but at the same time. Um, I don't know, it's it's a very dreamy city. So it's not necessarily that, I think there is enough outside for people to appreciate Italian culture as you walk in every single church outside the, the Biennale. And so the Biennale can actually bring more the international flavor of contemporary art. Yeah, but next year it's going to be Documenta and Venice in the same year, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what it's supposed to be, so. We'll see, <laughs> um, but it's uh, yeah, it's one of those years uh, where yeah, it's a, it's there's a lot, but also it's not just documenta actually because the whole kind of calendar of international exhibition has been shuffled around. So I think yeah. it's also going to be manifesta, Berlin Biennale, Lyon Biennale documenta so there is a and i think also uh istanbul um so there is a lot happening so yeah they're all being starved for art so i think it'll just be wonderful to have so much of choice right? yeah i hope so and i hope it'll be easier to travel but um <laughs> i'm 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 optimistic so <laughs> Okay, I'd like to come back to the idea of location. So in your interview with Andra Zanto in his wonderful book about of dialogues with 28 directors, you spoke of the importance of locations and their history and the role of museums in reviving those connections for the community. Would you like to frame the location of the High Line for us in the context of the artist communities that lived and worked during the 60s and 70s and the social history of these neighborhoods and how they helped to shape movements and identities in this district? Yeah, I mean, you know, the New York is a city that changes all the time. Um, and so one of the reasons of also doing the art program, the Highland is, if you're familiar with where the Highland is in New York City, it's located, part of it is in Chelsea and Chelsea is now the probably most important art district in America uh, because there are about 400 galleries, there are museums now, there is the Whitney Museum, the Shed on the other yeah. side, non-profit. Mm -hmm. so, it is the art district, but it's not always been. And so um, artists started and galleries started coming in the late um, 80s uh, when Soho, where they were before, got completely gentrified. And so they've kind of moved to the west side because uh, um, Chelsea was just an industrial, because of the Highland, it was an industrial neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The only thing that were there were storages, um, you know, food companies <laughs> and, uh, it's not, it wasn't, it, it's, well, now it's becoming a residential um, neighborhood, but it wasn't like that. So when we decided to do art was also on the Highland was also in a way to celebrate the artistic mm -hmm. uh, roots of the neighborhood. And so not only uh, it's a place where like the DR foundation first moved in the late eighties and then the galleries came, but then also along the waterfront, along the Hudson River, which is just a few steps yes. away from the High Line, uh, it, there were lots of piers because that's where the boats would come, but they've been slowly abandoned in the mid of the 20th century. And so starting from the 60s and 70s, those piers were um, completely derelict, abandoned, but they were starting to be used by, uh, by artists and activists to hang out or to turn them into um, exhibition spaces, most famously, <coughs> pardon me, Gordon Mata Clark did this incredible famous cut in the pier, which is, you, I, you, I, I could literally see it from the Highland, except that now it's gone. Um, but uh, so there was a creativity and a very important scene there that um, it's very hard to capture in a way and to maintain just because of course, now that, that side of New York has become extremely gentrified and there are tons of new buildings, but we try also with the art program to, to sort of celebrate that history uh, as much as we can. Cicili, do you need a sip of water? Do you need to get a glass of water? Are you no, okay? I'm okay, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about how we live in times of political and social 
turmoil and cultural institutions find themselves increasingly in the crosshairs of these debates. So how do we negotiate the way forward so that we do justice to the role of the that the institution needs to play um, while always, uh, also being sensitive to the needs of our community? How do we achieve that fine balance? Because we are living in quite charged times, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have an answer because here, and this is very much part of the American culture. So I, it's important to remember, it's, it's, um, I don't think the term balance applies here because <laughs> I think here everything is extremely extreme and it's polarized. And uh, I think there is, of course, a lot of debates in museums and cultural institutions about not just about programs and content, mm -hmm. but more importantly about funding and where the money comes from and the ethics of the museum. And um, what I see happening is it's rather extreme. It's nothing that is great, it's black or white. <laughs> But I think this very much belongs to the DNA of the American culture, so that in order to make changes, they have to go extreme. And so it's a very tough time, I think. You know, it's a time of rethinking your own institution and reevaluating your values and move forward. But um, some of these institutions are dinosaurs and they're never going to be able to change drastically the way, you know. The, some of the younger activists uh, want. So it's, uh, you know, I've been kind of witnessing this and it's on one side extremely important and relevant and the questions that are raised are extremely important. Um, but at the same time, <coughs> I don't see, I don't, honestly, I do not see yet a, any kind of solu like real <laughs> solution or like, a, a, like an alternative model to, to the kind of, idea that the museum is this old institution that gets dirty money from rich people. So, um, you know, we'll see. Uh, I think it's uh, some of the consequences of these debates are really important because uh, they, you know, they did provoke smaller changes within our institutions, but the radical shift has not happened. And I, I don't understand, I don't know how it's going to be able to happen in the current model of things especially here in, in the States. Yeah. Well, you, you, you're an Italian who's been working for the last 10 years in, and you've studied in, 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 the, in the US as well. But what does it mean to be the first Italian woman director and, and of Venice Biennale? And what kind of a responsibility does that bring? Well, it's of course a great honor, but also, you know, it's uh, sometimes if you think about it, it's rather shocking that there have been 59, 58 editions of the Venice Finale since its inception in 1895. And, uh, you know, the first woman curating the Venice Finale was in 2005, which I think is rather shocking. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I take it as a, as a great honor. And of course, not just being the, uh, among a group of very wonderful uh, colleagues that have done it before, but also thinking about being Italian and what I, how I can make this edition um, relevant also for the Italian cultural scene. Of course, you know, everybody's happy that the Biennale exists and lots of people come and go uh, to see also other places, but <clears throat> I want to be a bit more intentional in that. Uh, and hopefully uh, it will be also a celebration of, uh, um, of Italian culture. Okay, so I'm going to move to some questions now from our audience and uh, I can see some of them which have been sent in earlier and have come onto our chat. So um, this comes from uh, Shanta Mani, an artist, a Bangalore-based artist. Congratulating Cecilia Almani for being the curator of the Venice Biennale. I would like to ask what method she adopts in finding artists for her curatorial. Does her curatorial uh, encompass other voices in the arts that are not suitable for commercial or gallery art platforms? It's a process. So I, I've done a lot of research. I've had, because of, especially because of the restrictions in traveling, I had 
uh, people that have helped me recommending artists from all over the world, um, like advisors or correspondents. <clears throat> and uh, and I keep looking at things, you know, I have, I don't know how many thousands of portfolios of artists that I just go back to. And uh, I try to be intentional in the fact that uh, I don't just want to work with artists that have a commercial representation, um, mm -hmm. which of course, and the world is also changing, you know, it's th those dynamics are very complicated or maybe it's very easy to navigate. So I'm, I'm trying to, to make sure that I keep my eyes open and I uh, learn about all possible, from all possible platforms. So definitely I don't just look at galleries or museums, but um, I have to say that again, going back to the beginning of this conversation, it's been hard not to be able to, to travel and to, to assume that everything is on the web. So, um, Okay, so there's another question from Nalini Malavia, which seems seems to be along the same lines. Good evening, Cecilia. Your thoughts on how independent art practitioners, such as curators and artists based in India, connect or collaborate with international art events of significance, for example, the Venice Biennale? So the question is, how do they do that? Yeah, how do they get to connect and how do I suppose showcase their work there? This is what I think. Or get it noticed. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So you know, the Venice Biennale is uh, is not just the exhibition I curate, which is of course uh, the main thing. It's called the International Art Exhibition, and so that's fully curated by me. And uh, um, you know, I do. I run my research. I always listen. I have a website. If something comes from my website, I always try to look at it. Um, but then there are other ways, of course, to. Um, to to participate, you know, there is the national pavilion. I don't know who will do or how the Indian pavilion is uh, organized, but uh, mm -hmm. that's an independent contribution to the Venice Biennale. It's still part of the Venice Biennale, an official event, but I don't, I am not part of it. Uh, and then there are lots of collateral events that happened in the city of Venice, and. Uh, you know, it can literally be, of course, I'm not thinking about money, but it can literally be a group of people that decide to do a show about Indian art uh, and Indian artists find a venue in Venice and then a ton of people are going to go see. Of course, I'm, I, I, I'm idealizing because it, it, you still require fundings to do that and lots of logistics. And those are the three easy, not easy, the three basic things. Um, and I think somehow one of the most powerful things that happen in Venice is from a viewer perspective, when you're able to kind of create your own story or your own storytelling among all these different offerings, because of course my show eventually is going to be overwhelming because it's gonna mm -hmm. have over a hundred art. And, and so, but I think as a viewer, I remember just the magic happenings when you find connections also mm -hmm. between things that are not necessarily curatorially related. So I might go to my show and see an artwork and then I go to uh, the, you know, the French pavilion. And, and even if it's not the same artist, but there are some references and rhymes that become very important. So it's important the way I think of my show is not as a closed exhibition, but also as a portal. and. As, as a way that opens different entry points for people to kind of uh, create their own journey through Venice and through the many art experiences mm -hmm. that are offered there. Okay, there's a question now from Radhika Podar. I think someone's being naughty here, but how do we get you to do a partnership with Bangalore and make parts of the city come alive? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk about it when I finish this show. <laughs> After this show, I mean, I I would love to come to India if I could today, um, but it's likely gonna be a bit later. But um, yeah, we can talk about it after <laughs> after the big lift of Venice. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna club a few questions here. One from Vivian Paris, which says, "How many visitors walk the High Line in the summer months?" And uh, and there's someone at Louis Giansante who says, "Are there any webcams set up to view the High Line?" So first question, data pre-pandemic. So in 2019, for instance, there were over 8 million visitors coming all year long. 
Um, I believe the most visited day is Mother's Day, which is in May, at some point in May. And that sometimes is like 55,000 people in one day. Um, so it's like, I, I don't know, like it depends on the month, like May and June are really busy, but you know, it can be like half a million people come in a month uh, in the summer um, or like even almost a million people. So it's overwhelming. This is not what's happening this year. Of course, now the visitations has dropped tremendously, which, you know, to be cynical, um, we don't charge admission. So for us to have more people means that we have to raise more money to clean and to maintain the park. And we don't have any income from these people that come. Of course, you know, sometimes they buy coffee there and it's great, but it's not that we have a lot of income. So less people meant also that the experience of walking the Highland has become a bit more pleasant because the Highland got to a point in which was rather busy. Um, and so that's why the experience was just walking. Now it's amazing to see how people are using the park in completely different ways. They're running, they're jogging, they're having lunch, they're praying. And so it's, I, we were very happy to see that. Of course, we, we love having tourists and we'll always welcome everyone. But um, we got to a point in which we were anyway about to look at solutions to, to moderate the flux of people. And then webcams, no, I don't think there are, at least not from our organizations. There might be some kind of neighbors there, but I don't know. I don't know of any. <laughs> Since you work with living artists, how does your relationship evolve with artists as they mature and their art becomes less or more commercially valuable? That's a question. We like, to think of, we like to think of the many, you know, I think now we work with 250 artists since the beginning. We like to think of them as our core community. And so even though we might not work with them anymore because we've done already something, we like to stay in touch and follow their career. And something important for us is that um, with the exception of the video work, um, most of the artworks that you see on the Highland are commissioned and produced by us, which means we approach an artist and we give them the budget to uh, create that work. And so it's really like a platform for, for artists to experience and try something new uh, and something maybe they've never done before. In fact, we don't necessarily like to work with artists that have a lot of public art experience. We like to work with people that have never done it before. They might not do it again, uh, but at least we can provide them with that trampoline. And then we also like to follow where, what happens to the artworks. You know, most of the time, nothing, but like the fridge that I showed you before with the smoothies has been acquired by the Museum of Modern Art, which of course is an incredible um, reward for, for us and for the artists, or like an earlier, earlier piece by Sarah Z is now installed in a beautiful garden in Oslo. So we like to also follow the stories of these artworks as they spread over the world. Okay, let's end on a glorious note, food. You are from Milano and I know it's famous for its high fashion and the Duomo and of course the Last Supper. So tell us about mm -hmm. the food because Indians are great fans of pasta and you'll find it in all sorts of small eateries. Of course, the Indian version of pasta, but what is your favorite dish and do you carry the tastes of Milano across the world with you? Oh my God, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> I miss it so much. It's funny because, you know, people think New York, yes, in New York, you can have food from all over the world and it's delicious, but I do miss the food in Milan and it's just the simplicity of pasta. And the, the thing I miss the most is any kind of declination of bread, like focaccia and, and yeah. pizza, it's okay actually here. But uh, like a very good, just loaf of bread that is so crunchy and it stays crunchy all day. Here, it's, it's just, I mean, uh, someone from Naples would tell you it's just a question of the, wa the water is different. Uh, <laughs> and so there is no way, unless you import the, like gallons and gallons of water, you're never gonna make the same uh, kind of bread. Uh, but we're lucky to live uh, again in your city. And, uh, but I, I do miss the simplicity of things. Uh, of Italian cuisine you know it's uh, here everything gets richer and bigger <laughs> and sometimes less is more I know just a little bit of olive oil and pepper and salt sometimes it's just glorious. exactly I know 
<laughs> well, that's a lovely note to end on. Uh, Cecilia, thank you so much for spending this time with us. I, I know what a difficult time it is and there's just so many things happening in your life and your work, but it's been mm -hmm. wonderful speaking to you and he hearing about what you're doing. All the, the thank you for having me. And the High Line, it, it's such an exciting space and we're happy to bring that to our audiences. I'd also like to thank Anand for the sign language interpretation. Um, so, and we're screening an episode of Museums Without Borders um, that places objects from museums in conversations with each other. At the end of this, it's a short video of about eight minutes, wherein we are in conversation with the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. So, Cecilia, mm -hmm. if you have to leave, then thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. It was uh, lovely to be with you, and I hope next time I'll be able to come and be there in person. But uh, let's, let's be in touch and come to Venice if you can. <laughs> we will. Take we care. will. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.